following is a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production. I am back, and you are comfortably zoned with me, the Zigzag Man, in Alameda, California, right across the bay from San Francisco, and across the moat from Oakland in the northern part of what I consider to be the best state in the Union. I'm a native New Yorker, so it might be a close tie, but for weather, for um, for, for everything, for um, good liberal consciousness, I'm glad to be in California, and I'm glad to do this podcast because I get to talk to some of the most interesting people on the planet. Today is no exception. I have a first-time guest. He's up in North Dakota, and he's a sports guy, and anybody listening knows how um, I love baseball and um, and the other sports, too. So let me welcome, without any further ado, Mike Wagner. How are you, sir? Hey, I'm doing great, and how are things by you? Things by me are great. North Dakota um, brings back memory and memories in my world. Uh, I, in a previous carnation, um, sold insurance for a company based out of North Dakota at a Fargo. It's Pioneer Mutual. I'm wondering if that name ever crossed your your desk. Pioneer Mutual did uh, cross my mind somehow because I have a go- couple of good guys working up in Fargo. I had a guy that worked with me at KFYR, Jeff Boyce. He does some weekend work at KFGO. And the legendary sportscaster, Jack Michaels, does some play-by-play for um, the uh, North Dakota State Bison on KFGO and also on the um, Sister Station 740. So got some really good people up in Fargo and um, – also enjoyed listening to the late Scott Miller, who passed away with cancer, and uh, quite a number of great people have come out of Fargo, and me be, be up in Bismarck as well, too. So we're partners, uh, essentially, in that area. Now, to say this, it's, it's a really good time to be up in North Dakota right now. You know, it's, it's not necessarily the weather, I have to say this, but it's basically just the cost of living, a lot of opportunities, and just great people to be with. And, uh, you know, people are North Dakota nice, I'll tell you that. And they do love their uh, baseball, football, basketball, hockey, and just whatever else up in uh, North Dakota. It's beautiful. And Fargo, or I don't know if it was Fargo, but I know North Dakota is where Roger Maris was born and raised, if I'm that, not mistaken. That is correct. Roger Maris was uh, born and raised up there. And there was also an inter- interesting story about Roger Maris and um, you know how he made it through as well, too. And uh, some of the guys in Fargo can tell you about it, you know, playing baseball and whatever else. And, you know, just his ventures and being in uh, with the Yankees, obviously 1961 where he had that um, home run record and everybody had the um, the big thing about it. But also another two is um, a big thing about Roger Maris before we get more into that. Maury Wills, uh, you know, played for uh, the Dodgers for many years. He was a, uh, a, a color color guy for the Fargo Moorhead Redhawks with uh, Jack Michaels, and he was really good at what he did too. And um, Maury Wills is very popular before he retired, and er- er- everything else. And you know Roger Maris, um, although he was born up in um, Hibbing as well too, he attended Fargo uh, Central High School and um, just played baseball there. And he went to Shanley in 1950, played baseball, football for the Deacons, and one time during a 1951 game returned four kickoffs for touchdowns in a single game. And that's where he met his uh, future wife in the 10th game while both were attending high school basketball game. And how do you like that? And he was also a uh, stand-up there for the Fargo-Moorhead Twins back in 1952. How do you like that? All right. And most fans who remember Ma- uh, Roger Maris remember him as a Yankee with breaking the record. He was uh, a most valuable player in 1960 with the, in the American League. And that was the year before he and Mantle fought for the, the then Babe Ruth home run title. So he wasn't just a one-year wonder. He went on from the Yankees to the Cardinals, helped them win a couple of times, and... Um, 
had a very illustrious career, very underrated by some. A lot of people believe he should be in the hall. What do you think about that? I, I think there are some questions, too, about uh, who's going to the hall and everything else. I mean, he did have that outstanding season. But of course, you know, playing for quite a few teams and um, getting him to the promised land, you know, I guess it depends on um, – who, who does the electing? It could be guys who um, just view statistics or guys that just go on emotion or guys that just um, are from a different era. But um, Roger Maris, I have to say this, you know, having such an impact on the game, that's why I think it should be all about, like, what impact did you have on the game? And he, sh- and he should have been in the Baseball Hall of Fame. You know, just like Reggie Jackson, obviously um, hitting uh, – so many home runs for the Oakland A's, New York Yankees, and his big impact was hitting three home runs in that game seven of the 1977 World Series, and his third home run pretty much gave the Yankees a lead. And, and, and I'm trying to remember who the closer was in 77, you know, pretty much say, close out the game, and the Yankees won the title. Oh, it, it was 78. I'm it was sorry. Goose Gossage, as a matter of fact. Gossage, yes, that's it. It was Goose Gossage. You know, one time played for the uh, Chicago White Sox and loved watching him and closing it out. Just like I remember I had to uh, do a test article before I got considered for a school paper. And I simply wrote about game seven of the New York Yankees. Like, after one sentence, good enough. You're on the staff. <laughs> all right. All right. That was your uh, – were you a Yankee fan before? Or um, was it just an article that you had written? It, it was mainly an article that I did wrote because um, I somehow jumped on the Yankee bandwagon back at the time. But, you know, being born in Milwaukee and um, raised in Racine and later growing up in um, northwest suburbs of Chicago called Hoffman Estates, it, it was where it's like I've been a Cub fan for quite a while because of the fact that um, my dad gave me a Fer- Ferguson Jenkins hat, got back from convention, and I was cheering on for the Brewers. And back in the day, both the Brewers and Cubs were just – Arrow ball, I'll tell you. But, you know, you know, everybody hopped on the Yankee bandwagon, you know, like with uh, Reggie Jackson, Thurman, well, Thurman Munson, 77, before he got killed in a plane crash. And there, there was obviously the legendary Bucky Dent who played for the uh, Chicago White Sox. And, you know, just trying to go back to um, – He's not called Bucky Dent in Boston. What is he called in Boston? It's podcast radio. <laughs> Say it. Bucky, oh yeah, I I, I think Bucky Dent gets. Dent. Yeah, that's right. And um, right. now I'm trying to remember some of the other uh, 78 Yankees as we um, you know were talking as well too. But that was like the um, oh, the the big thing. Yes. Yeah, so and and of course um, just trying to look right here too. So hey, my favorite mm-hmm. was Mick the Quick playing center field. Mickey Rivers. Yes, I remember. It's all coming back to me now. And um, yeah. and, and here are the Battle managers they have. They have Bill playing third. Mm-hmm. Am I yeah. right? All right. Greg Nettles um, played third. And, um, and, and, uh, and I'm looking at this right here. This is all, all just jogging my memory. Let's see. We had um, this pitcher's uh, Ron Guidry. The, uh, Ron Guidry. Pack we had Louisiana 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 Lightning. Louisiana Lightning, that's right. Louisiana right. Lightning in one tw- 20 games on a consistent basis. Don Gullett, one-time pitch for the Cincinnati Reds. Ken Holtzman, one-time pitch for the Cubs, a very dominant lefty. And, um, and, and, and I think he was a guy that, um, that, that I think it was um, almost threw a no-hitter that one year. It was Mel Pappins in 72. Then he had well, let me tell you something Hunter. else about Ken Holtzman. Ken Holtzman pitched for a tremendous dynasty of the Oakland days back in um, the mid-70s. Uh, they won five divisions in a row, and right in the middle of that were three world championships. And Ken Holtzman, Vita Blue, Catfish Hunter, Raleigh Fingers, they all played an intrinsic part in that. Uh, what a terrific pitching staff the Oakland A's had back in the days. So, you know, you talk about one player, it jogs the memory of a whole bunch of different stuff. Who was the, what was the first game you ever went to, first baseball game? 
first baseball game. I'm going to have to really jog my memory on that one. And I have to say this. This is kind of like a semi-school uh, ditch day. Junior year in high school, it, it was close to uh, letting us out for spring break, but we um, decided to skip school a day early. Going down to Wrigley Field, and I think it was April – I think it was April 16th, I remember. It was one of my friend's birthdays, and I think it was um, – I'm trying to remember. I think it was in 77 or 78. It was at Wrigley Field, and um, we bought uh, box seat tickets, and it was on the 10th row over by left field. And I remember the Cubs were playing the Montreal Expos, and Tommy Hutton was uh, first base. Andre Dawson was in there, and he, and he had um, – yeah, Andre Dawson had like the uh, the top three um, outfielders for the uh, Expos back then. I think you had Ellis Valentine, and uh, I think you had Ron White and those guys. But I remember Dave Kingman hitting a grand slam in the fifth inning, and that pretty much uh, was the game right there. And someone asked, who won? We said, Cubs won 8-4, Kingman hit a grand slam, and that was pretty much our song right there. And I'm trying to remember who was the uh, picker from Montreal, but it was just an amazing game. I mean, not too many people showed up. You know, it was um, midweek in April, but um, a day game. They had no lights back then. And I, and I just remember that um, Dave Kingman was one of the dominant uh, players for the Cubs back then, you know, hitting home runs on a frequent basis. He grew up in uh, Mount Prospect, Illinois, which was not too far from uh, – Hoffman Estates, and he was actually a really good uh, athlete, played um, basketball, played football, but he eventually chose baseball and uh, went on to become uh, very successful. But Dave Kingman, he was the big name for the Cubs back in 78. That was like our first game we went. Dave Kingman at USC was a pitcher before he became an outfielder, and he was just as much a a prospect as a pitcher as he was anything else. And Dave Kingman, when he first came up, it was with the 71 year of the Fox, San Francisco Giants. And he was as fast as hell going from first to third with those long strides. You hit it right on the head. He was an athlete in his day. Um, Gets uh, a a bad rap a little bit for... um, some of the things that he did off the field, he was um, not the most sociable guy in the world. I remember he sent a a dead mouse up in a in a cardboard box to the um, a woman covering the A's, a sports writer, and um, he, that didn't make him very popular, among other things. He was a um, uh, prickly guy, let's put it that way. But boy, could he hit! Yeah, he, he was a little bit antisocial, but you know, you know, it back then was somewhat of a joke. But it was also disrespect to um, you know people in the profession. But um, I also remember too that uh, Dave Kingman was also known to strike out a lot because I think that year also in '78, not only he, he led the. Uh, Cubs in home runs. I think he also led the league in home runs. He also led the league in strikeouts. So every time I got up, it's like either hit a home run or strikeout. There was no single, double, triple, or anything like that. Sacrifice flies, but it was it was either um, a home run or a strikeout. And, and every time um, Dave Kimmel would just uh, give it a whiff, everybody yell, "That was a great air conditioning!" Because he just whiffed that so hard, though. I mean. He, he was just one of those players. Boy, but... I, I also remember that I, I went to a doubleheader at Candlestick Park. It must have been 1976. And in one game, Halicki hit. I was a Met fan and a giant apologist. Because I grew up, <laughs> I grew up a as giant a giant apologist? I never heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you had to be in those days. Um, but they were playing the Mets in a doubleheader, and I kind of had mixed emotions. But Ed Halicki pitched a no-hitter in one of those games. And in one of those games, 
Dave Kingman, I was sitting right behind home plate, and Dave Kingman gets fooled on a curveball. And with one hand, one hand off the bat, he hits a mammoth home run into deep center field. And I thought to myself, this guy's got more power than I ever thought he had because he was fooled on the pitch. And um, that's my memory of Dave Kingman. Besides all those years with the Mets and all those years with the Giants, um, and like you say, um, with the Cubs, um, quite a story. Let me ask you this while I've got you, because you're a maven. Tell me what your reaction is to the prospective rule changes th- that are have been announced and will be enac- enacted over the next two years. Um, Let's start with the 22nd rule between pitches. What do you think of that? I, 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 think, I think they're changing the game way too much to, uh, to appease the people who, who claim to be like, um, you know, atten- attention deficit disorder. It's like you're ruining the, the integrity of the game. It's like, you're, I mean, to me, you're going to cause more injuries. You're going to cause more harm to pitchers. And – they're also going to um, just alter the game dramatically in the wrong way. It's like I think it should be left alone, you know, you know, just as is. I mean, from from a fan perspective, it's like true games may be long, but the thing is, is that it's a good time to to spend with your loved ones or um, you know, your friends and uh, you know, get to know more, be more sociable, and everything. It's a, it's a time to bond. But for me, it's just like you know, there's already enough strategizing going on in the. Um, in baseball these days, you know, pitch counts and, um, you know, using stats like, you know, you know, so-and-so's batting like uh, 115 against this pitcher, but uh, let's um, sit him and uh, go up against this guy who uh, bats like 300 off this pitcher. It's like there's way too many stats being involved, and it's like there's no more, you know, gut check, gut instinct, or let them let em hit out there. But, you know, with that change right now, like, you know, between pitches, having times, it's like you got to have time to sit and figure out um, – what, you know, what's your next uh, plot's going to be, you know, shift your outfielders or um, change up the signs with the catcher. I mean, for me, it's just like, you know, a, a lot of the rule changes to me, it's like it's just ruining the game. That's the thing, the integrity of it. It's like, you know, may call for some uh, changes and uh, strategy, but I, I think, you know, between pitch counts, it's like it should be left the way it is. You're an old school guy and a young man. That's a great combination to be, let me tell you that, because you're absolutely right. The game itself, the strategy, uh, we're going to have, before you know it, there's going to be a DH in the National League, and that takes away a lot. Um, I'm lucky enough to live in Northern California where I have access to both the A's, an American League team, and the Giants, a National League team, and I see the difference in, um, in uh, the game. It's a much more boring sit-around, wait, instead of make it happen game as, in, um, as it is in the National League. So um, I agree with you. Who, is you. who got you into baseball? Who inspired you? Was it a, a relative, a friend, uncle, aunt? Well, it, it somehow I got myself inspired because I was interested in sports. You know, growing up in um, the Milwaukee Racine area, I actually got glued to sports where I was more into football, where my folks gave me, like, all this Packer gear, you know, Packer helmets, Packer shirts, Packer pajamas, and um, Packer dolls you could just uh, go to bed with. But there was a yeah, thing, it's like, you know, what's that, this? That's the problem, Mikey, with 30. <laughs> yeah, it was like, you know, for me, I'll just give away my age, you know, you know, being born in the 60s. And, um, you know, there was like this thing's like, oh, what's this? It was like, uh, it, it, it looks like uh, a tubby guy, it like a beer barrel and uh, hitting a baseball. I goes, oh, it's a Milwaukee Brewers. I'm like, what is that? A baseball team. I'm like, oh, what is it? And so I watched okay, a little bit. It's like, a banger. Yes, that's it. That's right. And, of course, you know, I, 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 
Harvey Wallbanger. Oh, my gosh. I mean, just a heck of a player. And, uh, you know, well, I'm lucky enough just... to remember when he played with the Detroit Tigers when I was a kid. And he had been <laughs> traded. He later went on to be traded to the Cleveland Indians for Rocky Calavito, said to be the worst trade made in Cleveland Indian history. And on some levels, they never recovered from that. Um, uh, Keen was a ter- terrific ball player, helped the Giants win a pennant in 1962, and was a legendary guy in Wisconsin. Uh, owned a bar, easily accessible to fans, and beloved guy who died too early, like uh, a lot of folks do. And and, and and it's rather sad, too, just um, see, seeing all this um, just – Go, go to waste and everything else. But another legend that comes to mind, it's like, you know, obviously Bob Uecker, you know, playing baseball in Milwaukee. He played baseball and stickball with my dad, just lived a few blocks away from each other. Oh, and Bob really? Uecker, despite, oh. despite, despite uh, batting 200 or 205 or 220 in the uh, major leagues, Bob Uecker just had a great, had a great sense of humor. And he was, and he, he too was a standout uh athlete in Milwaukee as well, you know, not just baseball, but football, basketball, and track, and he was just an amazing athlete. Although he batted 220, he just still had a great time and kept up a positive attitude with the Milwaukee Brewers and, um, you know, eventually did some play-by-play. He um, went into TV, Mr. Belvedere, and did all his light beer commercials. Bob Uecker is just an amazing guy, I have to say that. Still doing it into his 80s. He's in good voice, and he is one funny guy. He and Johnny Carson had a thing for a long time. He made a bunch of appearance, uh, appearances on the Carson show. And um, yeah, I don't know if you remember of, of the subject. I think I think Euchre played in Racine, which was a minor league um, team of the Milwaukee Braves when he was coming up. Am I right about that? Did they have a minor league team in Racine? I do believe they did have a minor league team. I did not go to any of their games, but um, there was a, a semi-pro team called the Racine Raiders, which uh, played football, but unfortunately I was not made aware of um, a team of Racine that played baseball. You know, my dad was always on the road a lot, and my mom always worked, and, you know, sadly enough, I wasn't informed that they had a, a baseball team in Racine. I could have just said, hey, can you take me one of their games, and, I was just uh, I may be confusing I'll, that with Eau Claire. I know that um, Aaron and a bunch of other guys uh, came up through Eau Claire, but seems to me Racine was another one of their minor league affiliates. I've been wrong before, and guess what, Mike? I'll be wrong again. Are you ever confused in names with Mike Wagner, the former relief pitcher? I, actually, no one has confused me as a former relief pitcher. Sometimes they'll make jokes about me being um, that safety from the Pittsburgh Steelers 1974 Super Bowl, making that key interception. Or, 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 they'll, or they'll say, hey, are you related to uh, Robert Wagner, the actor? Or people know to go and say, hey, I relate to so-and-so Wagner. I, I gave hey, no to every Wagner single answer. Yeah. History. He was the mayor of New York. Robert Wagner was the mayor of New York when the Giants and Dodgers moved to California. And a lot of people blame Wagner. A lot of people blame Robert Moses. And a lot of people blame it on the bossa nova. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because of the fact that um, it got to a point where three baseball teams just wasn't big enough. And California, obviously, open this um, opportunity circle and um, due to economics, you know, the Brooklyn Dodgers eventually moved to Los Angeles. And of course, New York Giants moved to San Francisco and the rest is history. And of course, we we're talking about Remember the San Francisco. Well, Mike, that could be a show within itself. Listen, we're running out of time. I want to know this about you though. If it weren't for sports, what would be your passion? 
I would probably say uh, me being in radio for quite some time, I, I'm, I'm more of I, I'm more of a music guy, and also, um, you know, you know, I would get into uh, news, some politics, and interview people and everything, and music and rock and roll is like my uh, big thing as well too. So I enjoy sports a lot, and um, I was going to um, tell as well too for next time about the story about Jack Clark playing for the San Francisco Giants, and uh, we I have a little Ripper. story about him, but that can be for next time. The Ripper, number 25, Jack Clark. Um, yes, that's right. He was a terrific character, and that guy was a hitting machine. Um, oh, he was, a, he was unbelievable. But the problem is, is that he too had an ad to like Dave Kingman, you know, very surly and antisocial, didn't want to talk to people. And I have a story about Jack Clark, which um, emulated him as a real jerk because uh, me and my same four, three, four buddies go to Wrigley Field and we're the ones to sit in the, uh, the box seats when we went to our first game. We sometimes sit in left field right, right up in front and guys buy us beer. We go to the right because the left field was um, packed. And so we we're up there and we, we had everything he goes, hey, guys, hey, guys, can you sign, can you sign? Sure. And, and we send our gloves and hats and everything right down and they'll be glad to sign and throw them up. We did the same for – for Jack Clark, and um, and 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 one of them hit hit hits him on the head by accident. It was a glove. Picks it up, drops drops everything, and walks away. And we're all giving the finger or going, "Boo, you jerk and asshole!" Everything like that. And and we're trying to get somebody to come over. And Pedro Borbon, who one time pitched for the Cincinnati Reds, came over and uh, tossed everything back up. Well, at first he signed him, tossed everything back up. We go, "Yay!" He goes, "Thank you." And he goes. Yeah, Jack Clark's an ass. <laughs> and, and so throughout the game, we we're harassing him, and I think it got to him where he must have made like three errors late in the game as the Cubs won. So I had a hilarious Jack Clark story where it's like it's important not to treat people like crap, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Boy, uh, isn't that the truth? Because you know what? You meet the same people on the way down as you did on the way up. And That's right. You're absolutely correct. Hey, listen, I'm going to sign off. Would you stay on the line? I want to talk to you after I do. Um, I want to thank everybody for listening. You got to meet Mike Wagner for the first time, and uh, you will be back. Promise me that. Mike. Yes, we will, and thank you very much. All right. Thank you for listening, everybody. I'm Ralph Tycho. It's the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network, and I am Ghost. The proceeding was a comfortably zoned radio network production. Thank you for listening.